Hi everyone, my name is Ara Sahakian and I am a gastroenterologist at USC. I specialize in interventional endoscopy. Uh, I'd like to thank the directors of this course for inviting me to speak today. It's really an honor to lecture for the nurses. And today I'm gonna to be discussing a few interesting endoscopic cases involving EUS and ERCP. So the first case is a 90 year old female with hypertension, atrial fibrillation who has a history of a cholecystectomy. She's on anticoagulation and she presented to an outside hospital with abdominal pain and nausea and vomiting. Her lipase was elevated at 3,500, her alkaline phosphatase and her transaminases were also up. Uh, she had a CAT scan at that hospital, which showed some uh, large bile duct stones and also showed evidence of pancreatitis. So there was a diagnosis made of gallstone pancreatitis. She did have two attempts at ERCP, uh, where they were able to cannulate the bile duct, but they were unsuccessful in passing the guide wire uh, above the obstructing stones. So the patient was transferred to our institution for an attempt at ERCP procedure. So initially, uh, the first thing we need to do is get into the bile duct. And uh, what you see here is that the uh, ampulla is on the rim of a diverticulum, which always makes things a little bit more difficult and complicated. And Initially, there was a lot of edema, and the bile duct was a little bit covered up uh, by that upper aspect, that tissue at the upper aspect uh, of the papilla, and we kept ending up in the pancreatic duct. So the first thing we generally do is we leave a wire in the pancreatic duct, and that does a few things. Number one, it just really helps to delineate the anatomy for us. It also separates the bile duct and the pancreatic duct and tends to straighten out the ampulla make it easier to cannulate the bile duct. So here I'm using a 543 cannula, which is a taper tipped, very fine tipped cannula, which helped me to find the bile duct, uh, which you can see is just north of the pancreatic duct there and, and was actually a very small orifice. So once we perform a cholangiogram, you can see here a large filling defect in the bile duct measuring uh, almost two centimeters in size. A stone of that size can actually be quite challenging to remove. So the first thing I did is to increase the size of the sphincterotomy. And you can see now we have a much bigger bile duct opening, which is not only going to help me uh, remove that stone, but is also going to help me get into the bile duct much easier in the future or if I lose access to the bile duct. So the next thing I do to, to make my life easier in terms of re removing the stone uh, is to dilate the papilla. So uh, I, I actually didn't take a picture of it, but I stole this image from Google uh, or borrowed, I should say. Um, and we're dilating the papilla here to 15 millimeters to really open up that papilla. And you can see in this picture on the right, which is from uh, my patient, where we've really opened up the papilla here and opened it to an extent where smaller stone fragments actually were just spontaneously passing on their own. And then of course, uh, you see some of these smaller stone fragments here, which we're removing with a balloon catheter, uh, but the larger stone uh, came out really quite easily after that dilation of the papilla, which you can see right here. So we perform our final cholangiogram where we use a, a balloon catheter to occlude the duct. And you can clearly see here that the duct is still quite dilated, uh, which is probably chronic in this patient from uh, having stones in the bile duct for many, many years, but the bile duct is now clear. Uh, and actually, uh, we were able to do this procedure uh, without leaving a stent in afterwards, which means we did not have to go back. We won't have to go back again to do this procedure in this, in this elderly lady with many comorbidities. So case number two, uh, we have a 56-year-old man with a a uh, history of heavy alcohol abuse and multiple episodes of previous pancreatitis. Uh, this patient had a, a recent episode of necrotizing pancreatitis. He had a prolonged hospital stay where he was in the intensive care unit. He had multiple cardiac and pulmonary complications. He uh, needed a peg tube for feeding. He also needed a tracheostomy. Uh, eventually he did recover and the tracheostomy was removed. Uh, he uh, did continue to have some residual symptoms of abdominal pain and early satiety 
and nausea and vomiting several months after this episode of pancreatitis. Uh, he saw his primary medical doctor who obtained a CAT scan, which showed a massive pancreatic fluid collection. So here's an image of that CAT scan. Um, we can see here, first of all, we see his peg tube, which is still in place in the stomach, which is this little dark spot right here. And then we see this very large fluid collection here. Uh, and we see sort of the remnant uh, pancreas, whatever's left of it down here. And we're looking at a, at a fluid collection here of about uh, 18 centimeters by 13 centimeters. And you can see that it's um, actually compressing the stomach here. So I'm not surprised that he's having these symptoms of pain and early satiety since his stomach is so compressed. And a smaller fluid collection here uh, in the um, posterior retroperitoneum uh, behind, the, behind the left kidney near the psoas muscle. So we did an endoscopic ultrasound on this patient where we can demonstrate this really large uh, fluid collection here. And we can see this kind of hyperechoic heterogeneous material um, uh, layering in this, in this collection here, which represents necrotic contents. Um, importantly, the entire collection is not necrotic, uh, but we do see that there is a pretty significant amount of necrotic material here. So we choose to do a uh, transgastric cisgastrostomy here. And you can see here that we've placed what's called a lumen opposing metal stent. So this goes through the wall of the stomach, uh, and into the collection and allows that collection to drain into the stomach. And uh, also importantly, gives us a portal of entry into that collection um, if we want to go ahead and do necrosectomy or other interventions on this cyst cavity. And we can see here in this picture on the right, uh, now we've actually gone through that stent with our endoscope after dilating the stent up. That allows us entry into the cyst cavity. Um, and you can see all of this uh, necrotic material within this cyst cavity. Now, uh, uh, some people will kind of just leave that drain in there and, and we'll try to let that necrosis drain through the stent over the next few days and see how the patient does. Or you can go in there and start doing some necrosectomy and removing some of this material right away. So what we chose to do is a, initially a limited endoscopic necrosectomy, which is generally how I approach these cases. Uh, on the index procedure, I'll do a limited amount of necrosectomy, which you can see here we're using, uh, you can use different types of instruments, um, but we're, what we're using here uh, is a snare to try to remove some of this uh, necrotic material, which you can see in the picture on the left. Uh, you really have to be quite cautious when you do this procedure uh, because you can have these very large vessels uh, that, can, that can traverse these cysts. And if you don't recognize that this is a vessel, and you can see a nice example of it here in the picture on the right uh, with the blue arrow, you see this, that very large vessel crossing that cyst cavity. And if you don't recognize that, it, it could be uh, very dangerous to disrupt one of these vessels. So the patient initially did well, uh, went home the next day, and then a week later started having fevers, called our office, fevers and abdominal pain. Uh, so we readmitted in the hospital, um, this type of procedure uh, with necrosectomy uh, does have a pretty high rate of complications and infection. Uh, so not surprising that this patient has to be readmitted. We, re we admit him to the hospital again a week later. And what we chose to do here is to place a second lumen opposing metal stent, uh, which you could see on the left. So we left the, the first stent in place. Now we place a second stent in a different part of the cyst. This does a couple of things. Number one, it allows for more drainage of the cyst. Sometimes these stents can get clogged up with the necrotic material. So now we've created a second uh, area where that cyst can drain. And it also allows us to place a nasocystic drain uh, through one of those stents into the cyst cavity, which you can see on the right, you can see this uh, little plastic drain that's, that's going through the patient's nose all the way down into his stomach, through the stent into the cavity. And it's um, coiled up here in the cavity. And what that allows us to do uh, is to actually flush the cyst cavity out with fluid. So we left this in place for about a week uh, and we had the patient basically um, use saline and lavage the cyst uh, a few times a day to try to keep that cyst cavity nice and clean. So here's a CT scan uh, that we obtained. You could see our two lumen opposing 
metal stents uh, in the CT scan image on the left. And you can see that in the image on the right that um, now we have a lot of air in our cyst cavity, which we expect. We also can see our nasocystic drain uh, coiled up in, in this collection. Um, but importantly, we also notice that, that this cyst cavity is already getting a lot smaller. So the patient underwent a few more uh, procedures with endoscopic necrosectomy through those, uh, through those lumen opposing metal stents. Um, two months later, we got another CAT scan. At this point, I've put some pigtail stents uh, into this cavity so we can just have some longer term drainage uh, because the pigtail stents don't have to be removed as quickly as the metal stents do. And uh, we can see here that this is cavity actually has gotten pretty small now. It's about five centimeters in size. So I left those plastic stents in for about another month or so. And when I went back to pull them out, this cavity uh, basically had disappeared. Um, and so the stents were pulled at that time and the patient has done quite well. So a little bit of information about walled off pancreatic necrosis. Uh, this generally uh, results from an episode of necrotizing pancreatitis. It's very important that we only intervene in these patients if they're symptomatic. So uh, if their stomach is being obstructed, if they're having symptoms like pain, nausea, vomiting, uh, sometimes the bile duct can get obstructed and that might be an indication to intervene. Or if we see signs that the cyst cavity is getting infected, that the necrosis is getting infected. So that might be signs like fevers um, or on imaging, you may see uh, air, uh, air bubbles in the collection, which might be a sign of bacterial infection. It's very important to make sure that any intervention, uh, whether it's uh, endoscopic or percutaneous or surgical, you really wanna to try to delay that intervention for at least four weeks until the collection is mature. And we always wanna see a CAT scan or an MRI uh, to make sure that collection is mature before we go ahead and intervene on these cysts. Patients do a lot better with interventions once these collections have matured and have a nice wall around them. Uh, any treatment for this condition really requires a multidisciplinary approach. We always involve surgery, interventional radiology, and, and, and GI. Uh, generally, this should be done at a center with expertise in, uh, in pancreatic necrosis and this type of intervention, since it can be a very complex uh, procedure um, that can have uh, complications, not infrequently. So the way we manage this is that the first line therapy is generally considered to be either percutaneous drainage or endoscopic transgastric drainage. We usually choose endoscopic transgastric drainage first, since percutaneous drainage alone can result in a fistula that leads to the skin. Uh, many people have used a combination of percutaneous drainage and endoscopic drainage with a lumen opposing stent. Um, and that's a good way to try to avoid uh, those fistula from forming. And uh, that has been, that approach has been used successfully. So when these minimally invasive approaches like percutaneous drainage or endoscopic drainage fail, um, that's when we look to our uh, minimally invasive surgical approaches like video assisted retroperitoneal drainage, uh, debridement, uh, or laparoscopic transgastric debridement. We, we generally suggest a step-up approach, uh, which has been studied now, uh, and that starts with either percutaneous drainage or transgastric drainage with a stent, um, like plastic stents or a lumen opposing metal stent. Um, if, uh, if debridement is needed, generally at that point, we'll move on to direct endoscopic debridement, which is what we saw in the case that I just presented. And of course, if none of these methods are working, then generally at that point, we'll step up to a surgical approach. So case number three, this is a 54-year-old male with a history of hepatitis C uh, and liver cirrhosis. Um, this is a, a sick patient with a meld of 30. And uh, this patient was transferred to our institution for a evaluation for liver transplant. A uh, CAT scan was obtained. It was noted that the patient had dilation of the intrahepatic bile ducts and some soft tissue, soft tissue thickening uh, or mass around the distal bile duct and in the portal hilum uh, that was thought to be uh, very concerning. An abdominal ultrasound was also obtained and there was a small volume of ascites that was seen as well as a portal vein thrombosis. 
uh, the patient's lab showed a total bilirubin of 32, which was uh, significantly higher um, than what this patient uh, had in recent months. An alkaline phosphatase of 680, AST and ALT were also elevated to 77 and 33. INR with minimal elevation to 1.3, um, but platelets also modestly elevated at 80. Uh, there was a concern for a pancreatic malignancy in this situation, and the decision was made to perform uh, endoscopic ultrasound and ERCP uh, for further evaluation and for uh, further management. So we see a cholangiogram here. Uh, I apologize, it's not really the best image here, but um, here we can see uh, the um, common duct. We can see the right and left hepatic ducts here. Uh, and, and where these blue arrows are, we see a, filling, a large filling defect in the distal bile duct, which represents a, a stricture of the common bile duct. So uh, the decision at that point was made to perform a, a sphincterotomy. So, so further um, stenting and therapy could be performed. And uh, we have a little video here I'll show. And what we see here is that, um, and, and very common in, in cirrhotics when we do sphincterotomies, uh, especially in those with portal hypertension and low platelets, um, we see bleeding, uh, which happens from the sphincterotomy. And important to understand that that bleeding may happen immediately during the procedure, or you can have delayed bleeding, which can happen after the procedure. So here, uh, we see immediate bleeding and, and a fairly brisk bleed that starts to occur here. So the first thing we did, which I don't have in this video, but we put a CRE balloon in there and we did a balloon tamponade. Um, and then uh, a really great way to manage this type of bleeding is a covered metal stent. So we place a covered metal stent here, uh, just kind of in the distal bile duct across the papilla. Note that we really left a lot of the stent sticking out into the duodenum. Uh, the reason that was done was to avoid having the stent cross the cystic duct in the bile duct. Uh, there is a risk of causing cholecystitis with these covered metal stents. So in this situation where we just need to kind of tamponade the, the major papilla, uh, we place this stent a little bit long sticking out of the bile duct. And you can see here already that after the balloon tamponade and placement of this covered metal stent, um, that this bleeding has already stopped. So, we do have several options for post sphincterotomy bleeding. Uh, it's important to note that if your patient starts bleeding later after the procedure has already been completed uh, and comes back to the hospital and represents with bleeding, you really want to do that procedure with an ERCP so that you can have all of these options, including stenting, available uh, to manage that bleeding. So uh, I think that the initial, you know, most uh, quickest things that we can do. Um, to manage this bleeding is epinephrine injection or balloon tamponade, which we did uh, for this patient. But keep in mind, this is a temporal effect. So these are not long lasting effects. Generally, we do these things just to kind of get us to the next step um, so that we can use other modalities to stop the bleeding. So of course, clips are an option. Uh, we do have uh, clips that are uh, really excellent clips now that, that work better with duodenoscopes. Um, but clips are and continue to be difficult to use with duodenoscopes. Um, you also really want to be cautious uh, to avoid clipping off the bile duct or pancreatic duct where we may end up creating cholangitis or pancreatitis. Um, but with caution and, and the right clip, um, clips can be used uh, during ERCP to treat bleeding. Um, cautery is also an option, uh, but again, risk of thermal injury, risk of causing pancreatitis with cautery, uh, so, so caution has to really be used there. Um, whenever you are dealing with a post sphincterotomy bleed, you definitely want to stent the bile duct. It's very important. That provides you with tamponade and also provides you with uh, good access to the bile duct should you need to get back into the bile duct. Uh, so, so a plastic stent can be used, but more and more uh, in our practice, we're using covered metal stents for patients with post sphincterotomy, uh, post -sphincterotomy bleeding. They can't be managed easily with other methods. Um, in patients who are cirrhotic with portal hypertension and very low platelets, actually, if I have to do a sphincterotomy in those patients, patients, even if there is no bleeding, I'll often place a covered metal stent because the likelihood of that patient having delayed bleeding is really pretty high. Um, the complications to keep in mind with these stents are that these stents can migrate. They can migrate out of the duct. They can also migrate into the duct and, and they can be pretty difficult to remove if they migrate into the duct. Um, generally, 
for post sphincterotomy bleeding, you just want that stent to be in, in place for a few days. Uh, so if that metal stent migrates after a few days, it's usually not a problem and will pass in the stool. The covered metal stents can cause uh, cholecystitis, as I mentioned. So if I'm placing this for a post sphincterotomy bleed, I usually will try to play, leave um, quite a bit of that stent sticking out into the duodenum. And I'll try to get an idea of where that cystic duct takeoff is to place the stent uh, below the cystic duct takeoff to try to prevent cholecystitis. So I put hemostatic spray here also with a question mark. Um, this has been used in post sphincterotomy bleeds. I have used this in post sphincterotomy bleeds, but you have to keep in mind this is temporal. It probably should not be used alone. It should be used uh, together with one of these other mo modal other modalities. Um, also, uh, we still really don't have the data for hemostatic spray in terms of um, in terms of safety and efficacy. Uh, so, so this is not really not something that I'm not recommending to do. Um, but of course, hemostatic spray is always an option um, in case of bleeding that's really uncontrolled uh, that you can't control in any other way. And of course, any of these methods can be used in combination with each other. If you have a really severe post sphincterotomy bleed, you probably are going to use several of these uh, methods of hemostasis. So we'll move on to case number four. Uh, we have a 47 year old patient uh, who had a distal pancreatectomy after trauma from a gunshot wound to the abdomen. Uh, this patient after surgery had a pancreatic leak um, and that pancreatic leak initially was managed with an ERCP, ERCP and placement of a pancreatic duct stent and the fluid collection was managed with percutaneous drainage. This conservative therapy uh, was done for about two weeks. Um, however, the patient had persistent output from their drain of about a liter per day of pancreatic fluid and really just wasn't improving. So uh, we had a multidisciplinary conversation and decided to pursue uh, endoscopic embolization therapy uh, with a coil and cyanoacrylate glue. So I have a, a video here um, that I'll show you of this procedure. So here we have a fluoroscopic image. Um, right here, you can see the tip of our catheter. Uh, contrast in, is injected and, and where you see the white arrow, we see a, a large leak uh, from the stump of the pancreatic duct um, extravasating there. And now we've passed our guide wire, which you can see here, this uh, radio opaque uh, uh, object, here's our guide wire, the arrow is pointing to the tip of our catheter. Um, and we've passed that all the way through the pancreatic duct into the fluid collection. Now we're injecting right at the site of the leak, which is really important to determine where that leak is uh, so that we can position our catheter accurately so that we can place our coil um, immediately proximal to that leak. So here you see us loading the coil, pushing it in. Now the arrow is showing us that coil. We've placed a figure eight coil in the distal pancreatic duct um, just before the site of that leak. Now we're positioning our catheter right next to that coil and we're injecting the cyanoacrylate glue. We're using a one cc syringe to inject that glue right at the coil. As soon as the coil, uh, the glue hits that coil, it should polymerize around the coil. The coil provides a scaffold for the glue. Um, we've, uh, so now we see our uh, glue on the fluoroscopy. We see our coil. We've placed a five French pancreatic stent which to, to decompress that duct. And this patient actually improved really quickly after a few days. We saw a resolution of that patient's, uh, we saw a resolution of that patient's leakage. Um, and about a month later, the pancreatic stent was pulled and that fistula had resolved. Okay, um, so just a little bit of information about pancreatic leaks and fistulas. Uh, a pancreatic leak or fistula um, often can result whenever there's damage to the pancreatic duct. Uh, that can occur with surgery, that can occur with trauma. Um, that can occur with uh, pancreatitis. Initially, we generally try to manage these conservatively, and most of the time they will respond to conservative management. So uh, generally, um, the patient has made NPO. Uh, sometimes octreotide is used to decrease those secretions. Um, if the patient isn't responding initially, we will perform an ERCP to place a pancreatic duct stent uh, that basically uh, decompresses the pancreatic duct and helps it to heal in the area of leakage. If there's a large fluid collection, we may have to place a percutaneous drain. 
So this type of therapy is um, performed for, for about a week or two. Uh, if the patient's not improving and still has significant drainage of pancreatic fluid, uh, then you can consider embolization of that leak uh, with a coil and with cyanoacrylate glue as we demonstrated in our case. Uh, surgical revision can also be considered uh, if none of these other less invasive options are working. I just want to thank everyone for listening in, and uh, I'm going to be available now to answer any questions or take any comments. Thank you very much.